Good morning, everybody. Grace and peace to you on this Lord's Day. It is a joy to see you this morning. I am Jim Hoffman. I am pastor here at St. John's. It is my privilege to welcome all of you to worship today. Those of you at home, we welcome you as well. We are glad that you are with us. We're going to encourage you to look online and find your worship guide and our sign-in form and encourage you to take a moment just to let us know that you are with us today. Those of you present, you will see a little black book in your row. If you would simply sign in and let us know that you are here today, we would appreciate you doing that. That way we get a, a record of our attendance for today. As you came in this morning, you should have received one of our worship guides, and I would encourage you to take a moment to read through it. Of course, everything you need to participate in our order of worship is contained in it, so just simply follow along, if you would please. It also has our invitations for this week, and I would encourage you to take a moment to read through those. Uh, a couple of things just to point out to you real quick for today. I want to remind you that next Sunday at 4 o'clock, our choir will be singing at Christ the King Independent Catholic Church. It is part of a concert series that is uh, going to take a love offering to benefit the church. They are trying to raise money to buy a piano, so we would encourage all to go and, and spend some time just listening to them sing and supporting this wonderful effort. Also, I want to remind you of all the kids' activities. You can read through those as well. Take a moment to look at them. And then want to mark your calendars for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. You'll see a note on the top of page 17. For Christmas Eve, we will have a 4 p.m. That will be a Lessons and Carol's Family Service, 6 o'clock traditional service, both of those will be candlelight and communion services. Christmas Day, we are going to pre-record, and we will send you an email Sunday morning. You can watch at home in the middle of all your Christmas Day activities, all right? That way you don't have to come here. So Christmas Day, we will be emailing our service to you. We're going to pre-record it. We're going to have fun with it and do some different things, but it's, only, it's going to be a shorter service, too. It's not going to be an hour long. It'll probably be a 30 to 40-minute type of service pre-recorded for you to be able to participate in worship on Christmas Day. Other invitations in here, I would encourage you to read through all of those. These are different ways in which you can worship, learn, serve, and witness with us as a community. There are some things that are timely as too, so make sure that you know about these, like the women's nut sale and also trunk or treat. So be cognizant of those. Pay attention to those if you would, please. Today we are going to continue our worship series, Fruits of Our Labor, and we're going to talk about Zacchaeus today, we're going to have a fun conversation about him, so I'm looking forward to that with, we, with you. As we continue in worship this morning, though, I want to invite you to turn now to page number three in your worship guide. You'll sing the, see the text for our opening hymn, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken, on pages three and four. We're going to sing stanzas one, two, and four together, and I'd invite you as you are able to please stand and let's sing. <laughs> Thank you. 
morning. I'm Allie Cobb, Director of Children's Youth and Family Ministries, and our call to worship this morning can be found on page four and five of your order of worship. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. We pledge to care for God's creation so that it will nourish and beautify the lives of all. All humanity is God's creation. We pledge to live in unity and fellowship so that all peoples can reflect God's goodness. God has given us wisdom and sound minds. We pledge to yield unto God's guidance so that we can receive God's instructions. God has given us the liberty of moral choice. We pledge to make decisions considerately so our judgments will be wise and fair. God has given us the word as directive for living. We pledge to establish it in our hearts so that we can live in meaningful obedience. From each to whom much has been given, much is required. We pledge to give freely of all that we have received, so that God's generous gifts be shared early among all people. We pledge to honor God's name in all the earth, world without end. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is on page five and six of your order of worship. It is Let All the World in Every Corner Sing, United Methodist Hymn number 93. The choir is going to sing it through once, and then we will join in um, a second time together. now time for children's moments so any children and children at heart that would like to join today you are more than welcome to do so good morning Nora this way <laughs> hi Bo hi Palmer hi Edie Ann how are you today well I have something to give all of you today what does Miss Allie normally give you candy, 
Sometimes Mr. Jim gives two pieces of candy. <laughs> I watched the playback. Okay, so today I have something special. Only Monday through Thursday. Only Monday through Thursday. Okay, I have some coins to give you guys. So you each get a baggie of coins. Do you know how many coins are in here? Three, there's a little bit more than three, almost. Oh, five, that's right, there's five pennies. So I'm gonna give you one baggie of pennies and one empty bag. And these are yours that you get to keep. Now you might wanna give them to your grown up before you go off to Sunday school with Miss Sue so Miss Sue doesn't get mad at me for you guys playing with coins during Sunday school time. But you have five coins to keep. And I want you to do something with the coins this week, okay? So it's a little bit of homework. Do you think you're up for it? Yep. Okay, so what you're gonna do this week with your coins is each time you do something extra nice or kind, you get to move one of your pennies over to the other bag. So I want you guys to do five things this week. You can do one each day or you can do them all in one day, but I want you to do something that's extra nice or kind or sweet that maybe you wouldn't normally do. Maybe it's helping a friend out or maybe doing something for your grown up at home that um, is extra helpful to them. But this week you guys are going to do five things. Do you think you can do five extra kind things this week? Yeah? Okay, now here's the fun part. When you're all done and you do your five things that are extra kind and sweet, you get choices. You get two options, okay, with your pennies. You can either one, bring them back to church and put them in the offering plate to keep spreading the kindness or you can give it to a friend and tell them to do five nice things so that they can keep passing it on and forward. How does that sound? Does that sound like something you guys can do? Keep spreading the kindness? So do you know, I have a little of something else to tell you. Do you know who the most important people here at church are? No, Palmer, it's not Jim. <laughs> She's looking over there at you like it's you. No, it's not faster, Jim. Close though. You guys are the most important ones here, or at least that's Miss Allie's opinion, that you guys are the most important ones here. Do you want to know why? Because I, yeah, I'll tell you why, Palmer. She's curious why she's the most important one here. You're curious. So I read something this week, and guess what? 80% of the grown-ups decide that they want to love Jesus before they turn 18. And 50% of those are under the age of 12 when they decide that they want to come to church when they're a grown-up. So it's my job, or part of my job, to make you love Jesus and to want to come here when you get a little bit older. Now, Jesus was a pretty smart guy. Can we all agree on that? Jesus was pretty smart. And Jesus wanted to teach everyone that the church belonged to children, too, because heaven is just as much theirs as it was the grown-ups. And there is a season for everything. And in this season, it is my job to let you know that you guys are a beloved child of God. So if you learn anything from me other than that I normally have candy, I want you to know that the sweetest thing on earth is spreading kindness just like Jesus did, okay? So can you guys do your five pennies for me this week? Yep, okay, let us pray. Dear God, thank you for showing us kindness through your son Jesus. Help us be kind and spread goodness throughout the world. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, I will let you guys go on to Sunday school now and maybe give those off to your grown-ups so that you're not playing with them during Sunday school, okay? But you may go with Miss Sue. Candy. It's better than candy? Well, thank you, Bo. That's one of the nicest things you've ever said to me. That's better than candy. <laughs> now, before I let Pastor Jim come here for prayers and concerns, I wanted to let you guys know that today is a special Sunday because it is Pastor Appreciation Sunday. And part of spreading kindness and joy is that Pastor Jim spreads a lot of kindness to us. So today we wanted to do a little something for him to help spread that kindness. So in the rotunda today after um, worship time, um, we will have some extra special treats. We have some cupcakes and cookies and brownies, and they might just have Jim's face on them. So make sure <laughs> to go out and grab something sweet, some kindness. And Pastor Jim's been here for about 10 years now, and I've had the pleasure of serving with him for four of those. But we did the math of during first service, and two of those were COVID years, which is, translates into dog years. So even though he's been here for 10 years, I've actually served with him for 16. <laughs> but it has been a pleasure to help him at serve you guys here. You guys are so sweet and kind. So thank you very much for helping us honor Pastor Jim today. Thank you, Al.
told her in first service, if I had known she was going to toot my horn, I would have given her 10 minutes to talk, not five. That's a joke. <laughs> We're going to take a break, and you guys can go get some coffee. That way you wake up. <laughs> and let's do our joys and concerns. All right. So on page seven and eight, you'll see our joys and our concerns and the Lord's Prayer. Let's take a moment just to look at those, if you would please, with me. Of course, we want to continue to remember those that are impacted by Hurricane Ian and, and many other things have been transpiring around our country and our world that have brought devastation to folks. Be in prayer for many. For Tim Doak, friend of Steve Doyle. Let's continue to pray for Gail Ween as well as she prepares for a surgery that's coming up. Christopher Lorimer, Bill Pike. Vicki Houts, who's recovering from uh, lung surgery, so be in prayer for her, if you would, please. Barb Meyer as well. And these others that are on our list, Chris Mueller's here this morning. Good to see you, Chris. He's got a birthday tomorrow, by the way, if you didn't know that, so just going to sneak that in there for you. But let's take a moment now to pause and pray. I want to invite you to a time of private prayer, an opportunity for you to share with God what's on your heart and mind today. In a few moments, I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer. After that, we'll pause for a moment. If there's a name you'd like to speak out loud, we'll give you a chance to do that so all might hear that name and pray for it, that person today. And then I invite you to join with me as we close together in the Lord's Prayer, again, as I said, on the top of page number eight. Let's take a moment now to pause and pray. O oh, gracious and glorious God who reigns on high, we mere mortals come before your throne today. And because of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Spirit, we lift to you our petitions. We are thankful, O oh Lord, for the blessings that you have given to us for this day that we might rise, breathe, be able to start our day out in communion with you and with one another. We pray that this might be an hour that we spend together that is refreshing for our souls, that motivates us to go out into the world this week, to seize those opportunities that you'll put before us, the opportunities where we might be good neighbors who share your good news. We thank you also, O oh God, for the many blessings, health, for our, our generosity and our abundance that we live in, for the place that we occupy, our homes, and for all that you have given us. These are treasures that so often we assume are ours to possess and use as, as we carefree, carefreely do. But may we be reminded today that we are stewards of all things. You are the creator of all that is around us, and so help us simply to be reminded that you have invited us to be generous people to be mindful that, that you have blessed each and every one of us in various ways. And so, oh Lord, help us to live into that today, to be generous of mind and spirit, to be generous with our time, our talent, our treasure, to be generous with our faithful witness in the world around us. 
We also come before you in this moment to ask of you various things. Some of us have brought our own prayer requests today, and they may be a burden, they may be a request on somebody else's behalf. It might be a moment where we are seeking you to just empower us for something. It might be a moment where we're asking you to deliver us. Oh God, hear our prayers this day as we share with you those things that make us anxious, fearful, stressed out, that drive us farther and farther away from community and may drive us a wedge between you and us. So hear us this day as we lift these up to you. Or hear our prayers today that are on behalf of someone else. We know that there are so many in our midst who have needs of body, mind, and spirit. We pray, O oh God, that you might just simply touch and heal, that you might journey and walk with those that are in need, and that through us, you might use us, your people, to be your active and loving presence with them. Or maybe we pray for circumstances in the world today, wars and rumors of wars, troubled economic moments and time, discourse and discord between us. We just ask, oh God, that you might walk with us, particularly as your people, who are seeking to be a different kind of folk in this world, ones who are marked by your grace, ones who try to figure out how to live out the fruits of the Spirit, which are things like patience and peace and kindness, lovingness long-suffering. We pray, O oh God, that you would give us the strength to be more that than the kind of people that we find so often on Twitter or Facebook or the other places where we see the news and listen to the talking heads who defame one another. We need leadership. We need guidance. We need the power of your spirit that can bring hope to a world that seems dark and dim a world that seems to be struggling to find that kind of hope, a hope that can bring a new day, a hope that can bring peace, a hope that can bring justice to a world that is broken in many ways. And so be with us today, O oh God. Hear our prayers, and in the power of your Spirit, move us to be your active agents that bring these things forth into our world. Now we pause to lift up any names that might be upon our hearts and minds that we wish to share now in this moment of prayer. All these things we pray in the name of your Son, who is our Lord and Savior, and the one who taught his disciples to pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Does he hear the fragile 
Today we talk about the tax collector. Well, guess what? They came around our house this week. It was a, it was a tax assessor. Took all the measures outside, left, left with the cards. That, it's that time of the, of the year anyway. On page nine of the worship guide, you'll f can follow along with the scripture. It's from the Common English Bible. It's 
Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and a wealthy, and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your home. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here I now give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, Dennis. Dennis and I got the memo today along with Jack. <laughs> All three of us are in gray slacks, blue blazers, and uh, striped shirts. So the rest of you just evidently didn't pay attention to the memo when it came out. Uh, just prior to COVID, our, our current Bishop Farr took all the ordinands on a, a trip to the Holy Land. And, and while they were in Jerusalem, the, the group had some free time on their hands, so they decided that they would go into the old city, and then they went to the oldest tattoo parlor in the old city, and they all got Jerusalem crosses somewhere. Most of them got them like right here on their forearm, big Jerusalem crosses. I, I gathered, I talked to some of them about it, and, I, and they told me it was kind of representative of a couple of things for them. Their ordination in the United Methodist Church, their trip to the Holy Land and to Jerusalem, and their continuing commitment to follow God wherever God leads in their lives and their ministries. Now, I'm going to anticipate a question that might pop into your head, and that question might be, Pastor Jim, did you get a tattoo when you were ordained? I'll come back to that in a moment. <laughs> About eight years ago, we did a family vacation to a rental home in Marathon Key, and Kendra and Davis and our two grandsons, Skylar and DJ, were there. Crystal and Bridget came with us as well. Jordan was single at the time, and so he took off work. He drove down from Miami, and he joined us as well. And while we were there, we did a lot of different things, but Kendra and Davis decided while in the Keys... Might as well get a tattoo. So the two of them went over to a local tattoo parlor, and both of them got these kind of a, a, a anchor thing that's on their wrist, and that's what they did. Mom and I didn't join. We didn't go. And I thought about this. All of our kids, except for Brooke, I believe all have some kind of body art, tattoos, right? Seven are, out of the eight of them all have something that they wear, and they're proud of it. Now, I know this still doesn't answer the question, but believe me, I'm going to get there eventually. So I was ordained in 2008. I was ordained by the resident, in, uh, the bishop in resident at the time who was Bob Snazy. Now, prior to Bishop Snazy coming here, we had Bishop Ann Shear, and for the 12 years that she was here, she had this tradition that she started taking ordinands to the Holy Land. She did that from 1994 to 2006. All of our ordinands got to go on a trip with her. Bishop Farr, our current bishop, brought that tradition back and started taking ordinance to the Holy Land, except for the two years where COVID wouldn't allow us. But he made that up and made sure that all of the ordinance so far have all been able to go, even including their most recent trip that they just came back from. Bishop Snazy, no trip. He didn't believe in those things. And primarily, he didn't believe in those things because he wasn't really all that comfortable in large groups of people. He didn't want to go travel around with us. He was a highly introverted personality. And so I didn't get to go to the Holy Land in 2008 when I was ordained, and thus I didn't get a tattoo. And when we went to the Holy Land a couple of years ago, I didn't get a tattoo then either, right? And we're going to go back to the Holy Land next March, and maybe with some of my fellow travelers, we might discuss it. But considering they're all my age or older, I doubt we're going to get a tattoo when we go in March either, right? So needless to say, 
I don't have any tattoos, right? But some of you do, and that's okay. That's fine. It's your body to be able to do with what you want. I just think of the level of commitment that it takes to be able to do something like that. I'm okay with needles, as long as it goes in and comes right back out, and that's the only time. It's just the one time that it goes in and out, right? I can't imagine being able to just take that for a, a period of time to have the needle go in and out multiple times. I have seen some pretty committed people, though, that wear a lot of ink, and maybe you have as well in the world in which we live today. You've seen some of those folks that have tattoos that are all over the place, and they're, they're proud of them, and they wear them well. Subway Corporation had a contest earlier this year. I don't know if you know about this. It involved the best tattoo that represented their most recent ad campaign. A guy by the name of James Koontz from Fort Collins, Colorado, entered the contest. And a, a famous tattoo artist inked the most recent Subway Series ad on his back between his shoulder blades. It ended up being 12 inches long and 12 inches high was the tattoo. He won the contest. Now he gets free Subway sandwiches for the rest of his life for making that kind of a commitment, right? Actually, what he got was a one-time payment of $50,000 worth of Subway gift cards. I can't imagine eating that much Subway. <laughs> Excuse me. And they can only be used at Subway, right? Talk about commitment. You know, you've got to really like Subway to put a tattoo of it on your back. Now, I like food, but I don't know if I'd ever tattoo a brand on me. You know, I like Chick-fil-A, but I don't, can't imagine wearing a Chick-fil-A tattoo or a Culver's tattoo running across my back or something like that. Now, maybe an Andy's Frozen Custard tattoo <laughs> with a subtitle underneath it that's like a James Brownie Funky Jackhammers or The Bomb. That I might consider, something like that, for a few seconds. If you think about it for a moment, it takes commitment to do things in life. It takes commitment to hit 62 home runs in a single season. It takes commitment to hit a golf ball well enough that you can win the Masters tournament. It takes commitment to design a structure that will stand for generations. It takes commitment to build wealth that can affect multiple generations in your family. It takes commitment to make a marriage last 40, 50, 60, 70 years. It takes commitment to do the right thing, the God-honoring things that come before us each and every day. In Jesus' day, tax collectors were not known for being men who typically were committed to doing the right thing, right? They were scoundrels. They were considered to be thieves and collaborators. The Romans taxed their subjects, but the military and the government never collected the taxes. They hired, they subcontracted the work out. In Israel, that was done by Jewish men. A man could bid on an area, and the bid was a promise that they would collect X number of shekels per year from that area and deliver them to the Roman authorities. But to make a living, the bidder would have to build in a profit margin. So they would collect over and above what they had promised to give to the Romans. That was theirs to keep. A chief tax collector was someone who bid on a region so large that they couldn't cover it by themselves. So they employed other men to collect the taxes on their behalf. And in order for the chief tax collector to make a profit, he charged his underlings a portion of their profit. And the underlings passed that on to the people that they were collecting the taxes from. And so you can see how burdensome the tax collecting system becomes for the people. The tax collector, the chief tax collector, the Romans, all got a piece of their hard-earned wages. And that doesn't even take into consideration the temple tax as well. So the Gospel of Luke says that Jesus was on his final trip to Jerusalem. And on the way, he decides to go through this town called Jericho. Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector for that area, heard that Jesus was coming, and he wanted to go out and see this man. Now, Zacchaeus, unfortunately, was height-challenged. He was short, so short that he couldn't see through the crowd of the people. So he climbs up a sycamore fig tree so that he can see Jesus and his party coming into town. Jesus sees him and tells him, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree because I'm coming to your house today. Now, think about this for a moment. 
Zacchaeus could have done something that, that would have probably been kind of normative in that moment, right? Could have uh, invited all the prominent people of the town to come over for lunch and hang out with him and Jesus. Maybe used his power and his privilege to figure out how he could impress this notable prophet. Or maybe just simply ask Jesus to perform a miracle or two, just for, for spectacle and fun, to see the power that he's been given. But Zacchaeus doesn't do any of those things. Instead, while Jesus is at his home, Zacchaeus makes a commitment to repentance and restitution. 50% of the possessions that you see before you, everything you see in my household, 50% of it, I'm going to give to the poor. Goes out and sells it and gives all the proceeds to the poor. And if I've defrauded anybody and they have a claim against me, I'm going to pay them back four times what I took from them. 400% return as an act of restitution. The man that was classified a sinner by the temple elites made in this moment one of the most generous commitments to restitution known in the scriptures. No one else parallels him. He made a commitment to do what was right and just and for the common good. And I believe, even though Luke doesn't tell us, I believe that Zacchaeus lived into that very thing. He had made that commitment and he fulfilled it. Now, I don't know about you, then I know that I've made some commitments in my life that, that I've not lived up to. You think about divorce. Divorce ends a commitment that you make to another person. Several years ago, I found myself on some very hard economic times, kind of in between jobs and really struggling, and, and I had a car payment, and I had to give my car back to the bank because I couldn't make the car payment anymore. I could no longer keep that commitment. Unfortunately, there have been times in my life where I've made a pledge to God in my local church, but haven't exactly, haven't exactly fulfilled that commitment, come up a little short on that. Now, don't raise your hands. I don't want to take a poll on this, but I will ask the question, am I in good company? Several of you get the daily devotion from Father Richard Rohr, and on Monday, September 26th, his devotion was titled, A Gospel of Humility, and in his devotion, he used the phrase, a spirituality of imperfection. We're all on a spiritual journey, and we're imperfect creatures on this journey. In Methodism, we talk about striving towards perfection. We want to live into that, hopefully, someday, hoping that at our last breath, the last moment that we're here on earth, we might meet that goal. But from there, most of the time, we're imperfect. We all know that we can't unwind the past. I'd like to unwind the past. I'd like to go back to some moments that are etched in stone and try to figure out how to erase some things that have happened, right? Wish away some things, do some things differently, but we all know we can't go back and relive those moments in life. We can only learn from them, commit to do better than what we have done in the past. And I think that's applicable to many areas of our lives, including our acts of generosity. Every year we come to this time, every year since I've been here, We've come to this point of the year, and we've talked about generosity. We take a moment to pause and reflect upon it for four weeks and to think about what it looks like for our lives in the year to come. And each year, we present you with an opportunity to make a commitment to God. It isn't designed to strong-arm anybody into supporting the church. It's a spiritual invitation to commit to do what will honor God and support God's work through your church. Yeah, we got a budget talked about it last week. I spelled it out for you, right? But a budget's a tool. It's a tool that empowers us to share God's grace with the world around us. It empowers us to meaningful relationships with God, with each other, with our local neighbors, and with people who live in other countries. Generosity is a matter of denying a selfish relationship with ourselves so that we might have a meaningful and life-giving relationship with the one who created us and with our neighbors. Generosity is a matter of denying ourselves for the sake of the common good. Theologian Justo Gonzalez says that generosity is a matter of free, liberal, loving giving. In short, it is a matter of love and justice entwined. And, and no one's asking any of us to take a dramatic step, like tattooing your commitment for 2023 on your arm somewhere so that you're reminded all the time of what it is that you've committed to do. God doesn't need that kind of an extreme commitment from any of us. But God does ask us 
to make a commitment. To let it be tattooed on our hearts, that commitment. And to be reminded of the love and the commitment that we're making to do what is right and just for the common good. A commitment card is a simple outward sign of that inward commitment to God. Your faith. Your community. And to think of it this way. We also know that generosity can be transformative. Zacchaeus found out that it could be salvific. So I guess what remains is this. How willing are we to make a sacrificial commitment to God this season? How deep is our love for God and our willingness to support God's work wherever it transpires? Would we be willing to climb up a sycamore fig tree so that God could get our attention, rise above the things of the world around us? Or think of it this way. What if Jesus came to your house this afternoon? What would you be willing to say to him during his visit? Let's take a moment to pause and pray. So gracious and generous God, we offer to you all the gifts and the richness of our lives as a sign of love and devotion and praise. Through these gifts and through our praises, we acknowledge that you are our Lord and Savior. And we ask that you empower us to make the commitment you invite us to. Enable us to sacrifice in a way that honors your generous sacrifice for our salvation. And may our generosity be a reflection of your deep commitment to us and our deep commitment to be disciples who lead a holy life that is a sweet aroma to you. In the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray these things. Amen. I'm going to invite our ushers to come at this time for our morning offering, and they're going to come to receive your gifts today. I want to invite you to take a moment to give lovingly. And those of you that are at home, we invite you also to take this opportunity to give as well. So you can do that either through our um, donation tab that's on our website or through Christian World Media and the donate tab that is there. Each and every one of you, though, that give today, thank you so much for your faithfulness and your loving generosity. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, oh, come on down. Oh, brothers, let's go down, down to the river and pray. number 11 of your worship guide, you will see the doxology, and I would invite you as you are able to please stand and let us sing together as we give thanks and praise to God.
So our hymn of sending forth this morning is We've a Story to Tell to the Nations, United Methodist Hymn number 569. We're going to sing stanzas 1, 2, and 3, and you'll find the text on both pages 12 and 13. you to take your worship guides home with you today. Take an opportunity as you come to your time of daily prayer to pray over the names that are on our list. As you come to your devotion time, there is also one that's included in here that you might use this week. And don't forget, read through all the invitations. They are for you. After the benediction, don't forget, take an opportunity to pass the peace to one another before you leave. Come and eat all the cupcakes that have my face on them, if you would please. Um, I would appreciate you doing that. I don't want to take anything home. So, all right. Receive this blessing as you go forth. May you go in grace and in peace. May you go knowing the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For they are truly yours now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.